Hi everybody and welcome to this edition of the UNLV Research Files. Tonight we look at solar energy, solar research, and the award-winning solar decathlon house, Desert Soul. Uh, to talk, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. First, we want to welcome back Tom Piotta. Thank you, Tom, for being here. Thanks. Tell us about the Solar Decathlon first. What is it? Sure. The for solar those of you who don't know. So the Solar Decathlon, it's an exciting project that happens every two years. And this year, or this past year, it happened in Irvine, California, where 20 teams from around the world are selected. So first for UNLV to, UNLV to be selected was a great honor. Yes. One of 20 teams from around the world to build a zero energy home. And it's around seven to 800 square foot uh, home. And it's gotta be a fully functional home. So it's gotta have all the appliances. It's gotta have a bedroom. It's gotta be able to wash clothes. You gotta be able to cook in it. Um, and it's gotta be a real energy efficient home. And it's gotta be student led project. And that's what you're gonna hear about tonight. How did you get started on this home? What, what prompted, prompted you to do the, the Desert Soul? Really, so I, I think there were several things that really stimulated this. This is a great opportunity for us to do several things. One, for us, or for our students to take what they learn in the classroom and really take that and, and do it in a hands-on environment. Um, so we really saw that as an opportunity for them to do that. It also was a great opportunity for them to work together in a real interdisciplinary team. You're going to hear about students coming from together from architecture, engineering, communications. Um, you know, even the hotel school was involved in this because they had to cook a meal in the house and oh, yeah. someone had to help them design what that <laughs> meal was, you know. Um, so it was a great learning opportunity for them to work in a real interdisciplinary team. In addition, it was a great opportunity for the university to connect with the community because for it to be successful, it had to have a great community support um, and the people from community really stepped up and helped connect us up with them and get behind this project in a real uh, significant way. I assume yeah. a lot of that was your, your role in this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, my role in this was really help with that, getting that, making that community connection work and then inside the university for the students to be successful, we had to have great community or university support in that too. So we had to make sure that there was that university support and then the students had to work within our university administrative structure just to get things purchased and things like that and I really helped make that happen for them. This wasn't just a one time, let's build this house, put it on campus and do this. It's an ongoing project, right? Right, it's, it's an ongoing project and actually the great thing about this project was it, it, took, it was a two year uh, journey for these, these students and the faculty involved in it too, um, but it has an afterlife now too. It's gonna be at the Springs Preserve, it lives there now, it sits there and, and the community gets to learn about what the great things that the students and the faculty did with this project and they learn about it and it's now a, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's in a place where the Springs Preserve, as many know, that's what it's meant to do, educate people about sustainable living. And that's what this house is all about, is educating people about what it is, energy efficiency in this case. So it, it continues to educate people, both our students and the community too. And what does it specifically do for the university itself? So for the university, it, it certainly, the, the recognition that we got out of this was great. We were second in the world. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty that's, prestigious, that's right? That's wonderful. You know? Um, so that in itself is great, you know, as part of the President's Tier 1 initiative, this is what we want to be doing more of, is being on a national platform in, in things like this and being well known in, in solar and renewable energy programs. Dr. Beam, Beam, who you're going to hear from tonight, is certainly well known in, in what he does and now this just really further adds to some great things that we have going on at the university. Is solar yeah. energy really the, the big deal here? Well, it's, it's, I think it's a big deal in, in the Southwest U.S. It's, it's a big deal in, in the on world. Um, it's a big deal on, on campus, I think, too. I think you're, you're hearing more about, in our community, it being, uh, it being more integrated into uh, regular houses now, too. Um, there's, there's developers out there now that are selling this as part of regular houses that they, that they are selling. And really, part of what this project is meant to do in, from the Department of Energy's perspective is demonstrating the technology. And I think that's part of what these houses are meant to do, is demonstrate how it can be done. Yeah. Tom, thank you very much. We're gonna talk a lot more about it in the rest of this half hour. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back.
think you found every hazard out here today? Think again. The spot you missed could be a killer. That spot on your skin could be skin cancer. Fact is, if you're a man over 50, you're in a group most likely to develop skin cancer, including melanoma, the kind that kills one person every hour. One in five Americans is likely to develop a form of skin cancer during their lifetime. That's why your best shot is to check for a spot. It's easy. Follow through and check your skin. It could be the save of a lifetime. Go to spotskincancer.org to find out how. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Oh, hey, bud. Oh. Where, uh, where are you headed? Uh, I'm just gonna hang out. It's a school night. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. Not sure about those two. I've been meaning to ask you. This is tougher than I thought. Is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. I hope not, because alcohol can lead you to say things and do things that you really wish you hadn't. Isn't this what you're supposed to say? I know. So if any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. Ryan. Yeah? So start the conversation even before they're teenagers. Good idea. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. A message from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Welcome back. Joining me now is Bob Beam, Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, you've been studying uh, all of this solar energy and other things for years and years and years here in Nevada. More than 40 years, I understand. You could talk for hours about all of the things you've done. You suggested three topics to us, so let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, the first one was about your work to reduce residential electric use during peak demand times, the afternoons, maybe in the summer, right? So it's really a big problem in the desert southwest where everybody has their air conditioner on at the same time. And it really stresses the grid. And as has been publicized many times, our grid's getting kind of old and feeble. Mm -hmm. And so the more stress is on it, the more potential we have for brownouts. So anyway, we have a project from the Department of Energy where uh, it's to UNLV and we have as subcontractors Pulte Homes and NV Energy. And this show a picture shows uh, uh, some of the uh, houses that are a part of that development. There are 185 there, and we've designed them such that they have minimal kinds of peak uh, demand through a variety of things, including the solar that's on them. They also have a battery that's uh, shown in uh, another picture here. And that battery? The battery is used. Stores at non-peak? Yeah, shifts the peak from daytime to uh, loads it at night, and then it can furnish the power during the daytime at the same time. Also, you, uh, we're one of five regional test centers uh, to study photovoltaics. Right. Uh, is it up and running? Yep. It's, this picture shows uh, three of the units that we have there. There's a fourth one being installed. And this is for uh, basically new products from manufacturers so they can prove them out at these five locations. And then they can go to the bank and they say, we know how well they work. And we have uh, a great deal of very intricate in instrumentation that allows these to be evaluated very comprehensively. Also, the focus been on solar energy here, obviously, at UNLV and, and in Southern Nevada. But this all connects together with water usage, with uh, everything we do in Southern Nevada is sort of intertwined, right? Right. And so uh, we have a large uh, grant from the National Science Foundation it involves actually all three uh, research institutions in the state, UNLV, UNR, and DRI. Uh, one of my colleagues and I put the proposal together, and it uh, looks at the connection between water, uh, environment, and solar energy. Our purpose is to try to develop uh, economic uh, good things for the state by uh, uh, making it smooth for solar uh, plants to be put in and not have a negative effect on the environment. One of the things I hear sometimes is that it's not economically feasible. In other words, for me to turn my house into a solar house, it doesn't, doesn't really make financial sense, but it certainly makes environmental sense. It does, and it could make financial sense too. 
because what we usually do is compare to what the electric prices are now, and there's a good chance, I don't know, I don't see the future clearly, but there's a good chance that the prices will go up. Once you put a solar system on, you've frozen your costs at that point. And so if prices go up, you celebrate them. And the, the, the future is just as bright as can be, right? I think so. Uh, there are uh, more and more uh, companies are coming out that have new uh, kind of interesting ways of putting them on houses in the sense that you don't have to pay anything up front. You uh, pay your electric light bill the usual way you pay it, and that goes to them, and they get for three years, and then the system reverts to you. So you don't really notice anything about uh, anything extra to your pocketbook as There's a no result of that. Huge cost outlay. And then three years later, you've got the whole thing paid for basically and, uh, and use it from there. We are here in the Southwest where the sun shines a lot. What about places like Seattle and, and Chicago and, and other Well, cities? I think uh, we've certainly got it better than those locations have, although there's a lot of activity going on in those places, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, which is an area I'm from originally. And with a lot of cloudy weather, they still have a lot of solar. My brother lives just outside of Portland, Oregon, has a big solar system on his house and is uh, functioning very well. So. This is one of the ways that UNLV sort of gets on the, on the map as a, as a major, major player in all this, right? Yes, yes. It's something that uh, I personally really believe in. I think it's ideal for our state. It could be a very good economic stimulus for our state to have a lot of these companies here that do that kind of work. We're hoping to get some that are actually building the units rather than just putting them in the field. So. Well, we're glad you're here. We're glad you've done all this research over all these years. Thank you very much. Well, my pleasure, totally. We Thank appreciate you. it, Bob. Thanks for being with us. Yes. All right, don't go away. Research Files will be right back. Every year, millions of young women try to change the skin they were born with and say they die for darker skin. Sadly, some actually do. Change your thinking, not your skin. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. I don't think anyone captured my first steps on camera. I was the fifth kid, and by that time, first steps weren't a big deal. I was 16 and driving home with my brother Ben. A distracted driver hit us. Ben died on impact. I had 47 days in a hospital bed for reality to settle in. With a major spinal cord injury, doctors said I would never walk again. But deep down, I knew I would. I prayed that every day. Family, friends, strangers, all started to pray for me to be able to walk again. The progress has been slow, and the victories hard won, but I feel the prayers. Whether you need support in a tragedy, or just to make it through a bad day, prayer can make a difference. America, let's come together by believing with each other. For someone to come alongside you and say, I'm going to believe with you, it means a lot. Before we were ever treated for breast cancer, we planned for life after breast cancer. We made the choice that breast cancer would not take something away from us. Unfortunately, not every woman knows her choices. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons is supporting the Breast Cancer Patient Education Act, a bill that will help make sure women who are facing breast cancer surgery are told about all their options. Help bring this important issue to light. Call your member of Congress and ask them to support the Breast Cancer Patient Education Act. Welcome back. Rick Hurd is a research engineer in mechanical engineering here at UNLV. Uh, we talked a little about the decathlon house del Sol uh, earlier in this, in this half hour. Uh, you were the engineering advisor on that house. Tell us a little bit about first building this house. Well, first there was a large design stage of the home. So we worked over a year just putting together the designs, working in different solutions you know, looking at different systems that we could use to reduce energy and everything. And then we went into the building stage, which most of the home was put together by students. They did work with a few contractors and a lot of people came out and volunteered their time to work with the students. Um, untypical of a project, uh, a normal construction project, we had probably 20 architecture students. Uh -huh. and and 20 engineering students, more engineers and architects than you normally see on any small job like that. This is only 800 square feet, right? Yes. But it had to be a functioning house, right? Yes. yes. It had to be livable. Yes. 
a little different than the normal home is we had to build it here, then disassemble it, yeah. truck it to California, and then reassemble it in less than 10 days, go through the competition, then take it apart again, bring it back to uh, Las Vegas, and set it up again at the Springs Preserve. Second place in the world. Yes. You must be very proud of that. Yeah, very proud. Um, we only missed first place by four points out of a thousand. Wow. So, you know, we were right there at the top, and the third place team was only two points behind us. So. Well, pretty good competition, huh? Yes, very. Did you expect to do that well? Did you, when you started out on this project? Uh, you know, when you're you're starting out, you don't expect it, and you know, early on in the competition, I didn't see it. Um, but you know, as the systems performed well, the engineering systems did really well. We were scoring high points in our marketing and architecture. And um, we watched the points creep up and pretty soon we were getting all kinds of texts from all people all over Las Vegas that were watching the scores. So. Kind of the final floor of engineering. And, and that and was all it. Of that. Uh, a couple other things you're working on. Uh, we were, you were telling me a minute ago about an air-cooled steam condenser. Uh, and I didn't understand it, but I sort of got it when you explained it to me. Tell me what that is again. Okay. Uh, typically at large power plants, they use cooling towers to cool the steam um, coming off of turbines. And this is pretty water intensive. It uses about 48% of the water drawn in the U.S. Mm. For power generation. So there are uh, large air-cooled steam condensers and what we're doing is working to try and improve the efficiencies of those condensers. So I'm currently building a large test unit where we can test different tube configurations, fin configurations, and uh, doing some modeling, uh, working with doctoral students on modeling the, uh, the inside two-phase flow in the tubes. Uh, so we can better uh, predict how they're going to perform, and then and you don't lose the water. And, yes, which is very important in the desert, as I as I understand. Yes, it. the the condenser is a sealed system. It condenses the steam and returns it to the uh, turbines, and no water is used. Talked to Bob Beam a minute ago about some of his research. You're talking about the photovoltaic uh, testing and, and the test center here. How's that going? Yeah. We just finished setting up the regional test center. It's one of five in the U.S. It's for the Department of Energy and it's man managed under Sandia National Labs. Um, we're, what we're doing is testing uh, manufacturer systems in various climates and in, for in our case, in the desert southwest with our high solar energy and high summer temperatures. Yeah, extreme heat does a lot yeah. of things, doesn't it? Yes. Rick, thank you so much for being with us today. Fascinating stuff. Keep thank up the good work. Thank you. All right. Don't go away. We will be right back. Talk with uh, students Heather Holstrom and Ginger Zhang. They were an integral part of the, of the solar decathlon. We'll be right back. I remember the moment clearly. I'll never forget that moment. As long as I live. I realized that moment. When we first saw the damage, these people really needed us. And I was going to make a difference right here in my community. Together with local responders, we cleared trees and collapsed walls. We had to get to the family trap beneath. As a citizen soldier, I made a difference. Be there for your community at NationalGuard.com. All the preparation, the training, it all comes down to this. To be a winning team, you have to work like a winning team. We have a job to do out here today. Some people think it's about muscle, but it's really about heart. A lot of heart. My team depends on me. And my team is 50,000 strong. Looks like a lot of work is going into this. what it feels like to be part of a team. A winning team. The action team. A action team. Action team. Get in on the action at actionteam.org. Are you in? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. The American dream need not forever be deferred. The richest 
the most powerful country On set with me now are two of the students who participated in the Solar Decathlon. Heather Holstrom is an architectural student and Ginger Zhang was the student project engineer. Welcome to both of you. Look at you with your, your t-shirt for Desert Soul and your hat and all that. Uh, you guys must be really proud of, of how you guys and how UNLV did in this whole thing, this, this competition. We are really proud. I think it's a great achievement, not only for us as students, you know, working on the project for a couple of years in the university, but for the entire Las Vegas Valley to kind of go out and have a really strong showing at this competition. So you started the, the, with the architectural design of this? Yeah, I helped out with the architecture design and then moved over to kind of project logistics and the public exhibit side. And then you're sort of the engineer to make this thing work, right? Right. Uh, we did all the mechanical system, uh, electrical system, plumbing system, fire protection system, and automation that makes a house um, work and unique. We've, we've got some pictures now that are coming up. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to see in the, in the pictures as they go by. Absolutely. So this is our home, Desert Soul. So it's designed to be appropriate for our Mojave Desert to live sustainably and comfortably in our desert. So here you can see kind of the back of the house where we have a large outdoor space that it opens out into. We used all natural landscaping native to the Mojave, so it would use very little water. And we tried to use materials that we felt reflected kind of the character of the desert, kind of giving it a mining town outpost feel. And you designed the system so that it was completely self-sufficient? Yes. Uh, so it's a net zero home, so it basically means it produces as much energy as it consumes. And we capture the solar energy in two ways, both in solar thermal, uh, which means we capture the solar thermal energy and use that to provide the domestic hot water, and as well as provide the space heating for the home. And then our solar panels, that's beautifully integrated with the roof that we work together with the architecture students on, uh, provides a shading for our outdoor patio and uh, also the electric, uh, furnishes the electricity. Uh, the one thing that surprised me is seeing the outside of that, I didn't expect to see that inside. Uh, it, it's really a, an amazing place. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a kind of dual house. You, you have this really rugged exterior, but on the interior, we kind of wanted to bring some of that Las Vegas luxury to the inside of the house. So it is designed as a vacation home. So minimal kind of upkeep on your exteriors, like I said, rugged, but on the inside, very comfortable, very clean surfaces. So you got it all built here and you got it all tested, everything worked, and then you had to take it all apart and move it to Irvine, California. What a project. Well, actually, to be honest, uh, the house was never really tested here. <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, as a construction project, that's why this house is really is really unique. Uh, we, we, uh, because we built, had to build it ourselves, and um, all the way till up to the uh, on the competition side, um, we know we. We, we basically like tested out there, um, but it was um, it was a great project. It was a lot of fun. What does this mean for the future uh, of solar energy, of southern Nevada, of cities in the southwest where we have an abundance of, of sun? So I think one thing that not only the solar cath decathlon as a whole tries to do, but what we tried to do as kind of a team is kind of show people in our community in the Mojave Desert, Las Vegas Valley, how they can incorporate sustainable practices into their own home, kind of trying to bring in some sustainability into our everyday kind of homes. And so that's what we tried to do for the project. So I think that helps kind of show people that this is possible, bringing that to the community. But also it's a great achievement for, for Las Vegas, as I said earlier, to kind of win at this scale of competition in an international wow. scale. Yeah, 20 teams from around the world. Uh, does this, I guess it's every two years they do this, mm -hmm. does this become a recurring event for UNLV? Uh, we're hoping we participate in the future solar decathlon for sure. Um, uh, we are not going to participate in the 2015, uh, but we definitely now have the expertise on how to how to run the team, how to recruit um, excellent students working on the team, how to engage with the community in uh, actually um, building. You know, we call it Team Las Vegas, actually. So um, as a whole community, in showcasing our um, higher education system. And if people want to see this, the house is now at the Springs Preserve? Yes, it's open to the public. They can come tour it. They've got a lot of information that we had at the competition up, so they can come learn about what we did as a team, what systems we put in, and 
maybe hopefully take some stuff away from it. And the most important thing is that this was a student built home, a student designed student built home. If a student can do it, we have the dedication, determination to do it, and really did well. Um, you know, it is can be uh, commercially viable in the future. You put a lot of your lives into this, <laughs> two years of your lives mm -hmm. into building this house. Uh, we know what it says about UNLV and about the exciting things that are going on here. We know what it says about solar energy. What what does this do for you guys? What 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 is your future now? Well, personally, it gave me great experience. Experience you just can't get in a classroom. Not only with designing and building a home, but working with the community, working with contractors, trying to get kind of our message out. And so. Hopefully those skills will help me in the future, but it's also helped me gain employment for after school. I, I'd certainly hire both of you. What about you? <laughs> yeah, it definitely shapes like my research, uh, my research interest uh, from the project. Um, not only and it made me kind of seeing projects uh, as a bigger picture than just engineering. Um, to push this kind of project initiative through, there's actually lots of interdisciplinary work that needs to be done. Not only architecture engineers have to work together, but uh, you know how to get the message out through um, like public media and everything. Um, we really learned a lot of those hands-on uh, real-world experience from this project. Heather Ginger, thank you so much for being with us. It's been wonderful, and uh, congratulations. You both have very bright futures <laughs> with, the, with the sun up there. Um, that's going to do it for us for tonight. We hope you'll join us next time on UNLV Research Files. Have a good evening. <laughs>